You may not have any idea what the title of this lecture refers to, but stick with me, with me for a bit and we'll get there. We may think that the digital era introduces fundamentally new dynamics to the media ecosystem. In many ways, however, digital technologies have simply amplified the dynamics created by the Industrial Revolution. It was steam power, not binary code, that birthed the modern news industry. One of the most prescient prophets who warned about the effects of this dangerous abundance of news and entertainment was Henry David Thoreau. The popular caricature of Thoreau as a hermit fails to recognize his deep commitment to justice and to understand the conditions necessary for a healthy political order. In both Walden and, even more astutely, his later essay, Life Without Principle, Thoreau diagnoses the diseases to which those who follow the news too closely are prone. Thoreau warns that the increased abundance and speed of the news threaten to fragment our attention and damage our ability to see what's really happening and then to think rightly about these events. As Joseph Piper puts it, in making a parallel argument, the average person of our time loses the ability to see because there is too much to see. Even worse, when so many voices vie for our attention, they have to get louder and more sensational to gain a hearing. Fake news, sensationalized headlines that developed, sorry, the sensationalized headlines that today would be labeled clickbait and yellow journalism all developed in the 19th century. In response to this unhealthy environment, Thoreau devoted his attention to what he called the eternities and cautioned against the dangers of being swept up in the flurry created by the news industry. In particular, I'll enumerate three symptoms that Thoreau thinks results from this fragmented attention, or what he calls a macadamized intellect. First, it induces a vague, underlying sense of boredom and disease, what he terms mental dyspepsia. Second, it renders us vulnerable to the wiles of advertisers and politicians. And third, it warps our emotional sensibilities, directing them toward distant, spectacular events and making it more difficult for us to sympathize with and love our neighbors. Before we get to Thoreau's diagnosis, though, we need a bit of context about the technological changes that he experienced. An image made to mark the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, Progress of the Century, highlights the various communications technologies invented in the previous 100 years. The printing presses used in colonial America were not much different from the one that Gutenberg used in 15th century Germany. But between 1800 and 1840, printing technology advanced rapidly. First came iron presses, then the steam-powered Adams Press and steam-powered rotary presses, then stereotyping and electrotyping. Alongside these improvements, steam-powered paper mills and new methods of producing paper from wood fiber dramatically decreased the cost of paper. Furthermore, other 19th century technologies transformed the nation's communication infrastructure. The telegraph, the railroad, and photogra photography shrunk the world dramatically. Indeed, the difference between words printed by hand and carried by horse or sail, and words printed by steam and carried by wires or rails may well be as vast as the difference between 19th century technologies and our 21st century digital technologies. In the midst of those changes, more and more Americans came to realize that technological advances don't necessarily foster moral growth. In fact, they can introduce new temptations and dangers. It's in this context that Thoreau wrote his lecture, Life Without Principle, as a sort of follow-up to Walden. His lecture is a critique of industrial standards of value, and Thoreau invites his hearers to consider the way in which we spend our lives, measuring our lives not by quantitative or monetary standards, but by whether we live up to our stated principles. The lecture's second half in particular focuses on how we spend our attention, and Thoreau pulls no punches in describing the dangers that the industrialized news industry poses to a principled life. Drawing on biblical imagery, Thoreau warns his hearers that newspapers can become idols. An obsession with the distractions of the daily paper can reveal an inattention, even an infidelity, to the ongoing work of the creator. As Thoreau puts it, I do not know, but it is too much to read one newspaper a week. I have tried it recently, and for so long it seems to me that I have not dwelt in my native region. The, suns, the, the sun, the clouds, the snow, the trees are not so much to me. You cannot serve two masters. It requires more than a day's devotion to know and to possess the wealth of a day. In this passage, Thoreau moves on from Jesus' warning against serving mammon 
to Paul's sermon at the Areopagus, where he tells the Athenians to stop worshiping idols and instead serve God because in him we live and move and have our being. Thoreau claims that the news competes with this God and offers an alternative, secular ground of being. As he puts it, if you chance to live and move and have your being in that thin stratum in which the events that make the news transpire, thinner than the paper on which it is printed, then these things will fill the world for you. But if you soar above or dive below that plane, you cannot remember nor be reminded of them. What we attend to reveals and shapes our loves. So if our attention is fixed on the thin stratum of the daily news, then we become guilty of a kind of idolatry, of misdirecting our love and even worship. This link between attention and worship or love may seem tenuous, but as the etymology of the word suggests, attention entails a deep mutuality or reciprocity that is at the root of love. To attend to something literally means to stretch toward it. The English words tension, tune, and tend all come from the same Indo-European root meaning simply to stretch. Tend itself carries this dual meaning that speaks to the nuances embedded in the notion of stretching. To tend means both to move towards something, a tendency say, and to care for something, to tend a garden. So attention signifies this relationship stretched between two different things. And embedded in the connotations of these related words, to tend to another or to be in tune with another, is a suggestion of propriety in this stretching. So when attention is exercised properly, a certain harmonious resonance comes into existence. And while attention maintains a difference between subject and object, we do tend to become more like that which we attend to. We become what we love. It's impossible then to attend deeply to something and not be changed. It's this transformative power of attention that leads Thoreau to a startling and I think profound metaphor. He claims that attending to the trivia of the news macadamizes our intellect. This is a term for a method of road construction named after its inventor, John McAdam, a Scottish engineer. While most roads were built on a foundation of large stones, McAdam used small hand-broken stones to surface his roads. The supervisors actually measured the stones to be sure that no large ones slipped through. The angular edges of these rocks would bind together and form a smooth, long-lasting surface for traffic. McAdam's name lives on today in the word tarmac, which refers to McAdam rows that were then sprayed with tar to cut the dust. So with that bit of background, here's Thoreau's description of how patterns of attention can alter our minds. I believe that the mind can be permanently profaned by the habit of attending to trivial things, so that all our thoughts shall be tinged with triviality. Our very intellect shall be macadamized, as it were, its foundation broken into fragments for the wheels of travel to roll over. And if you would know what will make the most durable pavement, surpassing rolled stones, spruce blocks, and asphaltum, you have only to look into some of our minds which have been subjected to this treatment so long. In this passage, Thoreau weaves together several key terms. And, uh, to begin with, profaned compares our minds to temples. Fain is the Latin word for temple, so profane literally means before or outside the temple. When we attend too closely to secular temporal affairs, we desecrate our minds. Hence, Thoreau goes on to say in the following sentence that we should make once more a fain of the mind. There are lasting, even eternal consequences for what we give our attention to. This is why Paul instructs the Colossians to set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Thoreau's use of the word habit emphasizes the repetitive, formative nature of attention. Thoreau's life and writings certainly demonstrate his own knowledge of contemporary events, so he's not advocating that we hold ourselves up and ignore everything that's going on around us. After all, Thoreau himself helped run away slaves. He participated in abolitionist movements. He even spent a night in jail over his refusal to pay a tax that would have helped fund the Mexican-American War. Such a social engagement flowed not from an obsession with the news of the day, though, but from his commitment to eternal moral truths. Thus, Thoreau is urging us to reflect on our habits, our patterns of attention that in turn shape and fill our minds. What does our daily reading look like? What do we turn to when we're bored? These are the habits of attention that shape our souls. 
Trivia is, of course, an indictment of the frivolous affairs that populate the news. But this word also cont continues Thoreau's road metaphor. Trivia comes from a Latin word meaning an intersection of three roads. So by implication, it refers to a place that's well-traveled or well-known. In English, it came to refer to things that were common and hence insignificant. Thoreau nods these roots when he writes earlier in this paragraph, if I am to be a thoroughfare, I prefer that it be of the mountain brooks, the Parnassian streams, and not the town sewers. Thoreau here imagines our minds as conduits or roadways for ideas. And we are responsible to choose what we want rolling down these streets. Yet when we habitually attend to trivial things, our minds turn into gravel or macadam and become susceptible to whatever ads or slogans or memes other people sp send spinning down our intellects. In his lecture, Thoreau goes on to propose a two-part remedy for this condition. If we have thus desecrated ourselves, as who has not, he writes, the remedy will be by wariness and devotion to reconsecrate ourselves and make once more a thane of the mind. We should treat our minds, that is ourselves, as innocent and ingenious children whose guardians we are, and be careful what objects and what subjects we thrust on their attention. Read not the times, read the eternities. As Thoreau acknowledges here, we have all to one degree or another desecrated our minds by attending to trivia. But Thoreau hopes that by first weariness and second devotion, we can reconsecrate our minds and make them into temples or fanes once again. If the problem is habitual attention to things outside the temple, the solution is habitual attention to things inside the temple. It's a two-part movement. It's a movement away from the gossip and trivia of the times, and then a movement toward the good, beautiful, complex truth of the eternities. And again, despite his strident rhetoric here, Thoreau is not advocating absolute withdrawal from the affairs of time. This is not some head in the sand denialism. Rather, Thoreau insists that insofar as we are formed by the ephemeral dramas and scandals of the daily news, we'll simply be unable to contribute meaningfully and redemptively to the real issues and concerns of our time. We'll instead be passive highways for the trends and outrage that populate our news feeds. While Thoreau didn't have 21st century research about the brain to support his claims that our habits of attention have long lasting effects, recent scholarship backs up his metaphor. As we become increasingly embedded in an, quote, ecosystem of interruption technologies that fosters a state of continuous partial attention, our neural networks are actually being restructured. Books like Susan Greenfield's Mind Change, How Digital Technologies Are Leaving Their Marks on Our Brains, and Nick Carr's The Shallows, How the Internet is Changing the Way We Think, Read, and Remember, chart the work of neuroscientists who are discovering the incredible plasticity of our brains we can indeed macadamize our intellects by attending to trivia. In the next lecture, I'll flesh out the contours of this more healthy posture that Thoreau recommends. But in conclusion here, I wanna simply name three effects or symptoms of a macadamized mind. The first is mental dyspepsia. At the conclusion of his lecture, Life Without Principle, Thoreau shifts metaphorical registers and compares the act of attention to that of eating. If we attend to unhealthy news, we, as both individuals and communities can get a kind of indigestion. This is what he says. Those things which now most engage the attention of men as politics and the daily routine are, it is true, vital functions of human society, but should be unconsciously performed like the corresponding functions of the physical body. Not only individuals, but states have thus a confirmed dyspepsia, which expresses itself, you can imagine, by what sort of eloquence? Thus, our life is not altogether a forgetting, but also, alas, to a great extent, a remembering of that which we should never have been conscious of, certainly not in our waking hours. Thoreau's vivid imagery, or perhaps I should say his pungent olfactory description, conveys the dangers of indiscriminate consumption of the news. An unhealthy mental diet results in a kind of intellectual bloating and discomfort. And the problem is further compounded because such a diet intensifies our craving for mental junk food. And this is not just an individual problem. Thoreau points out that states and communities too can suffer the dyspeptic effects of fragmented attention. Politics in the age of Twitter bears out his warnings. The second symptom is that, that uh, a macadamized mind turns our intellects into passive thoroughfares. 
This restless curiosity, this craving for some new bit of entertainment makes us incredibly vulnerable to the wiles of advertisers and politicians and ideologues. We become susceptible to the latest groupthink because our thoughts are dictated by trending jargon or viral hashtags. To return to Thoreau's core metaphor, a macadamized mind, an intellect that is ground to bits and made into a highway offers little resistance to whatever thought or emotion is driven down it. Hence, we become passive thoroughfares, the objects of our attention determined by whatever headlines or memes happen to be going viral. If our intellects are macadamized, we actually lack the vocabulary or the categories needed to see the world truthfully. We'll simply take in events around us through the prepackaged categories provided by the mass media. Hashtags and slogans lack the precision and nuance required to do justice to the complexity of our world and time. But if these are the only tools we have, we'll be unable to make adequate sense of the news. And then lastly, Thoreau warns that uh, macadamized intellects lead us to simply hack at the branches of problems. When we habitually attend to distant news, it's not just our minds that are damaged. We become less able to feel and then act responsibly. In Walden, Thoreau describes this problem by critiquing the recent boom in philanthropic activity. As he puts it, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. And it may be that he who bestows the largest amount of time and money on the needy is doing the most by his mode of life to produce that misery, which he strives in vain to relieve. Thoreau's polemic against the drastic philanthropy that seeks out the Esquimau and the Patagonian is famously echoed in fictional form by Charles Dickens's character, Mrs. Jellyby, a minor character in Bleak House. Mrs. Jellyby is a telescopic philanthropist fixated on helping people in Africa while blithely neglecting her own children. In our 21st century media ecosystem, we're all in danger of becoming Mrs. Jellybees, making the news media the primary lens through which we view the world magnifies the significance of distant, shocking events and obscures the important events that are happening close at hand. When our experience of the world is filtered through the news media, the tragedies that play out on our screens can seem more pressing than the ones that happen closer to home. And in this condition, we risk being like the priest and the Levite who passed by the wounded man on the side of the road rather than the Samaritan who saw, had compassion for, and took action to help his neighbor. This is a rather grim note to end on, but in the next lecture, I'll explore a Christian alternative to this macadamized condition. Thank you.